If you were hurt by trauma when you were a kid, you're already painfully aware of how the old hurts and fears and triggers come back to haunt you right when you're trying to take a big step up in your career. And it's not that you're not smart enough or capable enough. It's the trauma injury inside. It can rise up sometimes and make you say the wrong thing or lose your focus or get overwhelmed and take yourself out of the running for an opportunity that you really wanted. Has this ever happened to you? It's a terrible waste of your talent. And I want to show you some strategies so that even though you have PTSD from childhood, you can show up and be strong and do great things in your work life. I'm Anna Runkle, also known as the Crappy Childhood Fairy, and I teach people how to heal the symptoms of complex trauma from childhood so that you can free yourself from destructive patterns that maybe in the past have sabotaged your work life and held back your ability to rise up the ladder of career growth and income. I don't talk about money enough on this channel, I think. But as a person who grew up poor, I can tell you that a lack of money and fear around money can make you really vulnerable to more trauma in your life because it can pressure you to take jobs that are miserable for you and to cling to bad relationships only because you can't afford to leave. Now, our careers bring security and choices into our lives, both very important when you're setting your life up for healing from the past. Your career is also one of the ways that you express yourself, what you are, who you are, what you bring to this world and to the people around you. And when this goes well, it is in itself healing for the wounds of your past trauma. I believe we need to develop and express these gifts. And when that's blocked, and that's exactly what PTSD can do, it's miserable. It's, it's not just that you have all these symptoms, it's that you can't do what you're meant to do. And that is miserable. That's where you get the feeling that life is passing you by. Have you ever had that? When time is passing, but you're stuck outside of your life, it feels like, and the happiness you know you're capable of is like somewhere outside where you can't get to it. So that's a big part of healing from past trauma, getting your life back, becoming who you're meant to be and doing work that serves the world and that's fulfilling to you. Doesn't that sound good? Healing trauma isn't just about trying to be someone else. It's about becoming more, more of yourself. And yes, you are someone who was traumatized and you have great things to bring to this world anyway. This is your chance to not let the past limit everything about your future. What happened in the past, it's real, but what you do with your life today is even more real. So in this video, I'm going to show you how to spot where your PTSD is getting you stuck and teach you some strategies to free yourself and go further in your career than you thought was possible because the world needs you, all right? That's why we need you. So let's talk for a moment about the ways old trauma shows up in your work life. Now, in my experience, there are four main trouble spots. One is your ability to work with other people has some gaps in it. <laughs> some spots where you get triggered, especially around teams and your sense of belonging in them and around bosses and either their authority over you or trying to get their approval of you. Am I right? Have you had this? If you grew up with abuse or neglect, these ordinary aspects of working with other people, they can be just so fraught and confusing. And that can lead to you wanting to avoid people and challenges that are important to getting where you're trying to go. Or it can lead you to walk in like a deer in the headlights into work situations that repeat the abuse and neglect that hurt you in the first place. Bosses and coworkers who are bullies, manipulators, excluders, you know, the mean girls in high school. And if you grew up with this kind of thing, you might know that you need to get out of there, but it can make you paralyzed. You start to doubt yourself. And it's not rational, but that's what trauma can do. Okay. So that's the people you work with. The second way trauma can show up in your work life is in your tendency to get dysregulated around unpleasant people or just around any kind of stress or deadline pressure or self-doubt, which everybody has at work sometimes. Now you've probably heard me talk about dysregulation. It's a brain state that's common for people with childhood PTSD. Any kind of stress can make you feel spaced out, discombobulated, overwhelmed, or it can make you feel over-emotional with feelings like panic or rage or just getting upset until you cry, which is never fun at work, I happen to know. But it's especially painful when you're freaking out and you're confused about whether the thing that's upsetting you is even real, right? 
or you know it's not reasonable to be freaking out, but you can't stop. And if this has happened to you, you know there's a lot of shame wrapped up in it and that shame all by itself can stop you from being who you are and it can stop you from going for the work that you really love. So it's devastating. The third way that trauma can show up in your work life is when it crushes your brilliance. That chronic ongoing stress and intensity of having CPTSD in your brain when you don't have a way to calm it down, it just starts like robbing you of your ability to focus and it's draining you of your productivity, your enthusiasm, and it makes you feel like a dumbed down version of yourself. Have you experienced that? And of course, CPTSD symptoms create a negative cycle around money. I grew up poor, for example. My mother had grown up middle class and had a great education, but the chaos in our family around her addiction and drinking, if you have that in your family, you know how it gets wrapped up in everything and sucks the life out of it. So we were on and off welfare for several years. And when I was very little, we were hungry sometimes. And she'd go out for a while, for more than a couple of days sometimes, and we'd have to find something to eat and get ourselves to school. And my clothes would be dirty and I'd have no jacket, that kind of thing. So poverty can cause trauma and trauma can cause poverty. You can break that cycle, but if you haven't done it yet, that trauma can keep getting back into your life. Trauma has a tendency to beget more trauma sometimes. You probably have experienced that. Maybe your trauma symptoms cause you to lose a job or drop out of school, or you never go for anything challenging or well-paid because of that big trauma-shaped hole in your self-confidence, or you're worried that being around people and working with them is just gonna be too triggering, or you gravitate to cruddy jobs just because you know you won't have to deal with people. Kind of helps cut short that dysregulation. But it cuts you off from learning to work with other people and deal with them, which is a big part of being successful in life as well as work. And the thing is when you're broke or struggling financially, you are extra vulnerable to re-traumatizing yourself through the choices you have to make. Staying in a bad relationship or a miserable job because you can't or, or you feel you can't make that leap to something better. So what can you do to stop the negative cycle and start taking positive steps to do the important and meaningful work that you know is inside you? I call this breaking the wheel, okay? The wheel is that hurricane of bad thoughts and feelings and actions and outcomes that just goes round and round and it can be hard to escape. You, you don't even try to climb out, just break it. That's what I'm saying. Just take a big stick and jam it in there wherever it lands. Do the thing about your trauma that is right in front of you. Make the change that's doable for you. If something's too hard, not that, do the thing that's doable. Is it taking a class? Go sign up. Is it quitting a crap job? Maybe it's time. Is it changing where you live so that you can pay down debts and start building up savings again? Yes, that's a good idea. Being economical feels good. Start where you are and change the thing in front of you. When you're healing, work can be an opportunity to grow and heal and evolve if you're engaged in healing your past trauma. For this, a few things are important, all right? One is you need a way to discharge PTSD thinking before it spills out of your mouth and into your work life. Those urgent feelings in CPTSD that would make you lash out at other people or sabotage yourself when you're upset, you can always wait a day to do that, assuming you're not in physical danger, that is. If you need techniques to get those thoughts and feelings out safely, I've got a link in the description section that you can follow for my free course. I'm always talking about it. Look for the words free course down there and I'll teach you how to calm the symptoms so that you can take smart actions from a calm and clear place. The second thing I really encourage you to give yourself for healing trauma is support. Now, maybe this is a therapist, maybe it's a trusted friend, um, a 12-step sponsor, or a group who can be your sounding board when you don't know if you're being abused or just running through an old emotional loop. It goes both ways, right? And to learn discernment, it helps to have gentle feedback from somebody you trust. The third thing is practice recognizing when CPTSD symptoms are happening so that you can take measures to come back into a regulated state before you try to communicate or solve anything. And I'll put more course links in the description section if you need help with that. It also helps to be very practical about your work life. What happens with complex trauma sometimes is that unmet needs from childhood 
leak into everything else. And we can go through our workday hurting that we didn't get enough acknowledgement or appreciation, things like that. And yeah, that can be a real thing. But for those of us who didn't get it as kids, the pain around it can get kind of oversized. So this is something to try to stay grounded about, to keep expectations right-sized. Now, one thing I didn't learn until pretty far into my career, and it made a bigger impact than anything else I'd learned up to that point, is that when you take a job, you're paid to make the organization and the other people who run it successful. And I did used to be somebody who didn't get that. I was worried more about what the job was giving me. So that's important, but it needed to be balanced with what I contributed. And I'm telling you, when this was explained to me by a mentor, not a work mentor, I never had a work mentor, honestly, but someone helped me see it, that shifting my focus like this made my career finally take off out of dumbed down work and on to a series of new opportunities that ultimately led me right here to be with you, trying to help you be successful. You can consider orienting yourself in a similar way towards the service of other people. Now that's not being a servant, that is bringing your gifts to bear. And I'm telling you, there is nothing more satisfying and fulfilling. It requires a lot of continuous learning, but you'll see how your old sense of disappointment and hurt sort of just gets swept away by a sense of self-worth and dignity when you're serving. Now, when you're bringing the best of yourself to work, not being a doormat, not being a Klingon who stays in bad situations, but bringing your best self, it gradually reveals even more of the goodness that's coded into you. You were meant for better things than a life that's limited by trauma. You're designed to heal and to grow and to bring good things into the world through everything you do, including your work, including the way you make money. If you have a history of trauma, I know you know how much it can come back and trigger thoughts and behaviors and limits that hurt your work life that drag down your hopes of advancement in your career. Hardly anybody talks about this, and I don't know why. It's such an important part of life. Of course, the symptoms of childhood PTSD can hold you back at work. And I'm gonna walk through some ways it does that and how you can turn it around. Not just so that you have a fair chance at success and professional fulfillment in your life, and of course, financial security, hello, but because doing work that's meaningful to you, feeling some sense of accomplishment, some personal growth through your work, it's part of how to build a happy life. Now, at any level, work can be stabilizing. It can be a path to overcome the chaos of your childhood. It can be a way to overcome poverty. It's certainly been that for me. And work connects you to the world. And I know some jobs are horrible. I've had some of those too. I know what it's like to have to do work you hate just because you need the money to survive. But work gets us up in the morning. It draws us out into the world, into interactions with other people. It can be a second chance to learn how life works. And it can be a place where you come into your own, where you blossom. Now, even if you don't have that now, even if work is so triggering for you, you're just like, you know, locking yourself in, there is a path out. And I encourage you to set your sight on that path. Working is a large part of life. And even when work is menial, our engagement with it can be healing and uplifting. It can be a way to bring more good into the world. And that's really important too. So how do you do that? How can a person with a history of trauma rise up like that to become a person who finds joy on the job, who becomes an agent of goodness and of usefulness, who brings peace and comfort and order to environments that would otherwise be, you know, hard hearted or chaotic? Work is a way you can encourage other people and they need that. Work is one place where parts of who you really are can show up. And of course, work is a way well, to get money. Let's talk about money. Money is how you have choices. Anyone who's ever been stuck and broke without work does not romanticize money. <laughs> of like, oh, money, it's just evil. It's like, no, money is choice. Money is survival and then money brings choices. Without money, you can be stuck in a terrible situation. You could be trapped in a bad relationship. So it's so important to learn how you can generate money through work so that always, no matter what's going on in your life, you're fulfilled and you have choices. All right. So what are some of the childhood PTSD symptoms 
that can show up at work and hold you back. Number one, you end up working for people in organizations that untraumatized people would know not to work for. There are people who are abusive, dishonest, exploitative. It's not safe. And there is this tendency in people who grew up having to crap fit, to fit themselves to unacceptable situations at home, to be just too good at it. It's time to stop. Stop fitting yourself to bad things. Begin to get clear about what your standards are, about what is an appropriate, good, decent, workable situation where you can do your job. What kind of people do you need to work for? Get clear about this. This is one of, one of my symptoms of CPTSD is feeling like I just get sort of like buffeted around and end up in jobs like the only job that came along in the little that I was able to look for a job because I was really depressed or, you know, the, the first place that hired me. In my life, I've paid the price for not, for not exercising choice. And I've ended up in situations where I was really unhappy and I spent all my energy kind of pushing back against the thing I didn't like about the job rather than going, I don't like this job, I'll go somewhere else. And luckily, ever since I've been in the process of healing my trauma, you know, which is basically like 29 years now, I've been coming up and up and up. So things that fit me when I was younger, less experienced, but also still really underneath the weight of my trauma symptoms. Well, I'm in a different league now, and I've been in progressively better leagues all along where I could learn to, like I could do good customer service now that I don't have loss of control of my emotional you know, state will be just because I'm triggered. I have a way to, you know, compartmentalize that, put it aside, deliver the good customer service, and then go off and use my tools to deal with the dysregulation that happens. So you can really change your station in life by learning to work with your own symptoms. But for gosh sakes, do not get into work situations that are only going to make it worse. And don't kid yourself that just staying in a bad situation at work, that just staying there, well, okay, I know the thing that you should have, you know, you should keep your job until you've got another one lined up. I know that. But you have to weigh that against what happens to your spirit and your psyche when you sit there and take abuse. And what happens, and this is true in romantic relationships and just bad situations in general, you get eroded when you tolerate bad situations like that, bad treatment. It wears you down until, you know, you'd be at a job interview and you'd be like, hi, I know I'm not worth very much, but I thought I'd try. You know, you can't, you can't bring that energy and spirit that you need for the job interview. So staying in the job isn't everything. And I know money is always a consideration, but please take care of your spirit so that abuse doesn't wear you down to the point that you can't even try to take your step onward and out. Number two, you end up working for someone who is funnily very similar to your abusive parent. And you fall into the same role that you once played in, in response to that person, whether that's people pleasing, overworking, rebelling against them, getting resentful or immobilized or suffering because you're not seen. That was my thing. You know, I wasn't really seen by, by my mom and I just kept getting bosses who would just completely overlook me. And no, they were not reading my mind or looking out for my best interest. And I later learned like what you have to do. You have to ask for the raise. You have to state what you feel that you would like to be doing and how much you should be paid for it. And then if they won't do it, you go somewhere else. I didn't do that for a long time because I was very insecure about whether I deserved more. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Sometimes though, not working for the type of person can help you not play your old role. So, you know, CPTSD symptoms are sticky like that. So that role, you know, the role where I become like the long suffering overlooked Cinderella that I had in my family of origin, you know, <laughs> they all get to go to the ball. I have to stay home and scrub the chimney or whatever. That was, it's a little bit of a metaphor for what it was like for me, but I kept playing that role in jobs. I, like literally everybody went off to a, a conference once, a conference that I was really like probably the person who most should have been at it. And when they came back, they said, here, transcribe the recording. I remember that there was a moment of clarity. I'm like, I'm out of here. This is like, this is wrong. <laughs> but I had enough healing. I think that was maybe like three, four years into my healing when I was like, wait a minute, this isn't right. I actually am really good. It's a long story, but I wrote a book on the topic of the conference and nobody else had. And, uh, yeah, it was actually like a bad dynamic with the boss. The boss who had some sort of like, I don't know. I don't even know what. I don't even need to know. I think it was like competition or sexism. Who knows? I just know I needed to not work there anymore. And now I don't. So yay. <laughs> 
Okay, this is number three. The person you work for is actually fine, but you parentify them anyway, waiting for them to realize how good you are um, and feeling jealous of the favor that they show to other people, waiting for them to give you better duties and a raise. You don't ever advocate for yourself and you end up resentful and not giving your best. So this is another version of like the abusive parent, but how about, you know, the boss is fine, but the old parent dynamic, you're coming up and projecting your half of it. Like there's no way I'm going to be treated fairly. There's no way my needs are going to be met. They're against me. I can't, I can't. So when that's operating, that can really hold you back too. Like nobody has any idea idea that that's going on in your head, but they're soon going to notice the outward manifestations, you know, the way that you kind of resist and hunch up against, against growth and opportunities or questions or difficulty. And, and so, you know, I always want to remind people it's, it, it makes sense sometimes to contain your feelings and to behave and to be appropriate, even when your thoughts are inappropriate, <laughs> you know, that you can't get away with expressing them. But the thing is, we all have a nervous system. So in a way you can't really hide what's going on. People can feel it. And just for example, when somebody's like really angry and then you go, is something wrong? You seem angry. And they go, no, I'm not angry. You know, they are. If your nervous system works, you can feel it. I've heard theories that our nervous systems are like one giant organism, really, you know, and in a way that makes sense to me. That's how we have collective conscience, perhaps. That's how sometimes we have intuition about others. We actually have some form of connection that... Uh, may or may not be, you know, if, if it's physical, it's on some atomic level. I don't know what it is, but I just know I can't hide how I really feel. And so the healing has to happen for me to be perceived as not angry, as not terrified. You know, I have to honestly be who I present myself to be. That said, I, I totally believe that sometimes you fake it till you make it. Sometimes you act as if, sometimes you pretend you're brave and you start your first day of a new job, you know, even though it is frightening and there's a lot of doubts and all that. So sometimes we do that, but just remember people can sense it. Here's the thing. This is about parentifying your boss. Do not parentify your boss. They're not your parent. The other thing about parenting, parentifying your boss is it's a, it's, it's, it's a disordered dynamic right there because this is actually a contractual agreement. Now, a lot of times it becomes like family on a job, but it's a little different than a family in that they can fire you and that's it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's all they can fire you or they, it, it, there's so many things that can happen there that are not like a family. But a lot of times, because we have fuzzy boundaries, because our emotional needs weren't met in our families, then that, that sort of need for a family kind of goes in and weaves its tendrils into the whole job situation. And what happens is if you're not treated fairly, if you're not invited to stay on another year, it can be devastating as if you've been cast out of your family which could have already happened in, in your actual family, right? So it's devastating for a person with those wounds from a family. So the way to head it off is to learn to have kinds of relationships and to be very clear with yourself through doing your homework, using your tools, having the support of a mentor. I really encourage you to do that. <laughs> tools and mentor, very potent combination. I can talk about that later in this video. But you want to do that so that you approach the job with actually a realistic dynamic that you bring half of that dynamic in of like, this is a contractual arrangement. I, I have made an agreement with you that you will pay me if I do this job. And if I do this job well, that's one thing. And if I do this job badly, that's another thing. And if I would like things, if I would like to advance in this career, if I would like to get a raise, I really want to do the job well. I want to have a good relationship, but not one where I'm emotionally melting down, acting on like opening the portals of hell to those old childhood wounds and behaving as a rejected child. I was a rejected child and I have brought that energy to work and it doesn't make sense at work. And it's a very difficult position to put somebody in. And it's not something that tends to get you a raise or advancement. So you know, I, I can sort of, I can predict the comments from people who are feeling hurt by this and just feel like, but it's not fair. And I'm just going to say, yes, it is fair. A job is a contractual agreement. And if you've been at a job a long time, there are family like bonds there of loyalty. And, but, but in the end, in the end, a business has to look out for itself and sometimes at the expense of its people, that's how it works. And it's, hard, but it's how it is. And how it is, is a very good thing to be able to see, recognize, and work with.
So other bonds are more permanent. Other bonds have other obligations, other, you know, to stick with you through thick and thin, to love you even if you can't do your job. You know, that's a different bond. So there is so much, you know, my, my career was so liberated and set free. Like I was very stuck. Uh, I've often told people here, I couldn't get a job at McDonald's when I was 16. And I often got jobs because of my smarts, but a lot of because of the emotional energy I brought to jobs and um, that made me um, difficult, unreliable, kind of a handful at work. I didn't get along with some people too, a little too much of the time. I did not advance. They couldn't put me in charge of things. And so I often had this beautiful luxury of being able to create a job for myself, but it never involved moving up. And there was a real ceiling on how much money I could make. And that was not acceptable because for nine years, I was a single mom. I had to have enough money to get by. I had to do it. And so I did something different that when I learned this lesson and I left that job, I went and got this other job. And this was, a, I, I was very surprised. I got a 50% raise when I got a different job from the job that I had been, you know, very miserable and feeling stuck. Then later I went back to the old job and got another raise that was effectively double what I had made there in the past. And it was actually appropriate for my level and my education and for what I was contributing. The where the place that I was working, if I were, if you were to ask me now, I wish I hadn't gone back there. Yes, I got money, but I was still working for the same people who didn't think I was worth it, who complained, you know, who <laughs> didn't give me opportunities. And there were so many ways that that job was like having a terrible boyfriend. You know, I used to say that it's kind of like having a boyfriend who won't commit and you've had children already and they still won't commit <laughs> and they won't help out and they won't, you know, that's what I, I just, it's like, well, that's interesting because that's what was going on in my real private life. That's what was going on. And that's what happens. Unhealed trauma leads us into trauma-driven behaviors that are just going to keep playing out as that thing that is unhealed. So I did, I just, I had not healed that part of me that I, it's hard to define. Like, why would I do that? Why would I get into a relationship and have kids with a guy who wouldn't commit to me? Why would I do that? It was a lot like the, the, the dynamics in my home. You know, I didn't have that kind of like diehard commitment from my mom and the, my dad, my, my birth dad, who did feel that way about me died when I was a teenager. And so I don't know, I just kept crap fitting myself. That was one area that I could crap fit really well. And so I did. And I was very driven by a fear. Like I'm never going to have anything. I should just take what I can get job wise, partner wise. I should just take what I can get. And, um, it all worked out. I'm very happy now and my life is full and, and I have kids and, you know, it's, they're adult kids now. And so healing, you know, it's funny how our healed life can work with us wherever we come from. It can work with whatever wounds there are and life can unfold and be wonderful anyway. So don't worry. Don't worry if you've got problems right now. Don't worry if you're stuck in old patterns, but listen to me because I'm going to, I'm telling you a list of things at work that are, that can really hold you down. And you can start changing those even if you don't have everything worked out in your life. All right, you ready for another one? Okay, this is kind of an extension of the last one. And this is where, you know, you've you sort of slipped into a family dynamic at your job and all of your energy is about trying to make them get it about you. Where you, what you can do with that energy is to take it and improve your skills and your knowledge and your options. And I can't stress this enough. Like evidently this is what normal parents teach their kids. <laughs> so I'm teaching you now have, having gone through this cycle and, 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 you know, move through and had these opportunities finally open up to me, but it came from, you know, I went and got a master's degree and I actually didn't use that master's degree. It was very fancy and I thought it was what I wanted. But when I worked there, that was the job I really didn't like. And I wasn't really using it. And one thing led to another and I've ended up creating creating three different businesses for myself. And I recommend this. If you have CPTSD and family dynamics have a way of leaking into your workplace, I just found having my own business and having clients that I served was a lot more clean and straightforward and not like a parent, not like a family. I sign an agreement with somebody. I work for them for a couple of months. I, I, used, to, I used to do customer service training as a consultant. Then I had a video production company and now I do crappy childhood fairy and you're my client. And so when I, when I work directly with people like that and not through an employer doing something, it just really works for me and it's motivating to me. And if it ever goes south, which sometimes it does, I've had some very icky clients before. Well, you, then you just don't work with them again. 
It's so cool. So you have a lot more mobility to keep making, you know, if you're a person who's changing dramatically because you're healing your past trauma, doing consulting and changing clients often is a way that you can kind of keep upping your game and not waiting for somebody else to decide if they're going to give you, you know, a promotion. I, that's never worked for me. That's never worked for me. In my younger days, I was a comedian in Hollywood. And before that, I had been trying to make it in acting, right? And I never did. I feel like I could really act now, but, <laughs> but when I was doing that, I had to wait for somebody to think I was the right person. And they'd be like, mm, well, you have kind of a character face and da da da, and you should get your nose fixed. They, you know, everything that I would ever have would be decided by somebody else. And I was like, you know what happens with comedians? They write their own ticket. <laughs> they, they write the role for themselves and anybody can get up on stage and do comedy. So these are just some examples of twists and turns in my career where I kept discovering where I could bring all my potential to bear. I think that my upbringing, I think that my trauma symptoms had really diminished and marked me as somebody not quite suitable for things that I actually was capable of. I had a lot of growth to do and I have set myself free. And honestly, crappy childhood fairy, everything I told you of the work that I've done before, it all came together into this job. So you never know if you keep working on yourself and your skills, by the way, that video production company, I had to teach myself to edit on Google. I Googled, how do you edit video? That's how I did it. And then I started charging money for it and I got people to pay me and eventually I hired a staff and, but I still, to this day, I do know how to edit video. I taught myself how to do it. So when people say, oh, I don't have an education, I'm like, okay, education is a thing. It's valuable, it's real. But if you need money right now, there are things you can teach yourself on this thing that we're on right now, which is the most powerful source of learning there has ever been in human history. There's quirks that I could complain about about YouTube, but it's all here. Like everything that you want to know how to do, it's here. And if you're motivated, you can teach yourself. So don't waste energy on some crappy boss who doesn't get you. Put your energy into learning things that you can either finally get recognized there or go somewhere where you are recognized. Like work is a joy. Work can be a wonderful way forward. I gave you a big speech about it at the beginning of this video about like, Money is important and it doesn't stop there. What's important is that connection to the world, that feeling of usefulness, the feeling of having somewhere you need to be every day because people are counting on you. These are the ingredients of happiness. I'm still talking about things that can hold you back and then what to do. So here's another one that can hold you back. And this is a, this may not apply to you, but it sure applies to a lot of people who had trauma. You're in a line of work that's like loaded with traumatized people. All right, so I used to work in a nonprofit that was about a political thing that was very divisive, <laughs> very life and death, very intense. And one day I realized that about 80% of the people who worked there were adult children of alcoholics like me. And when adult children of alcoholics haven't healed, that's a really common symptom is being very excited by drama, conflict, drama, you know, playing the good guy and getting in there. And, you know, I'm glad there are good guys out there doing this stuff, but it was a really sick environment for me. And when I healed, I had to get out of that office because being around all that like trauma, drama energy and just like, oh my God, oh my God, you're not going to believe what Congress did today. I just, and I was just like, oh, bleh, I want to get out. And then I also, I used to like the show ER and I just, I just like didn't anymore. I'm totally into shows that are high drama now. But when I was in my early recovery, I couldn't watch TV. That was, it was all about adrenaline. And it was just so funny because they were acting out these like terrible scenarios where you're just like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And then in, you know, I was about a year into recovery where I realized this was stressing me out. It was draining me. And, I, and what I was really seeking through my recovery was to have less drama, more calm, more just like connection to things, more awareness. So trauma and fear as entertainment has its place, right? It's like horror movies and roller coasters. I've loved all of those things in due time. <laughs> and I used to think, you know how, you know what, how when rock and rollers get old and they're like 80 and they do songs about like, I like to sit on the porch. It's a nice sunset. And I used to think, oh God, I never want to be like that. Well, now I'm like that. <laughs> now I'm like that. I like songs that bring me peace and sort of help me appreciate life. So we are where we are. Okay. <laughs> what I'm saying about the professions though, <laughs> trauma driven professions, um, uh, you know, emergency services person, you're, you're out there in the ambulance dealing with wrecks. A lot of people who are nurses, especially nurses in like a trauma unit or an ER, um, 
I don't need to tell you, very, very highly populated with people who grew up with trauma. And the fact is, most people find those jobs inhibiting to their ability to start changing their level of dysregulation. So that's a, that's a dilemma, right? You were drawn to it initially, and now it's starting to be an obstacle. But you know, if you change careers midway, you'd be like me and a lot of other people. It's okay to change careers. And a lot of times what you've done before is, is, is so helpful for educating people about some reality that you've worked in, you know personally about stuff. Like I, I did, I worked in public health for 30 years. I know a lot about that. I know how to talk to people who work in public health. I know the sensibility. I know the way funding works there and how that can drive the agenda. I know how to work outside of that while being respectful to it. So this is a skill too, is being somewhere and leaving it. And you can do that. All right, here's a, here's a characteristic that can get in the way of your career success. This one's kind of general. Trauma response, okay? Fight, flight, freeze, fawn. Fight, that's where you get very argumentative and high conflict. Um, flight, you escape, you run away, you drink, whatever. Fight, flight, freeze. Freeze is you just take crap. You don't do anything about it. Um, and fawn is you're like, oh, let me try to make you feel better. I'm sorry. I'm sorry you're mad at me. Let me fix it. Okay, so those are four trauma responses. There may be others, right? Fix. Um, other things that start with F. <laughs> That's a trauma response, right? <laughs> I won't go there. But your trauma responses are too strong. So when work is stressful, which it can be, your trauma responses come off and it's just too strong. You know, you're too argumentative. You're too escapist. You know, you don't show up for work. You call in sick when the going gets tough. You freeze. You take all these, all this abuse and you don't change jobs or you fawn. You keep trying to make them like you and see you and get you. See how I'm talking about trauma, ex trauma responses through all of this? So that's kind of a general one. I probably should have said this in the introduction, but, but that's a, that's a thing that can get in your way. So trauma responses, they're natural. You want to kind of, we all have all of them at times and we tend to favor one or two of them. And you want to come back to center on that. So that instead of having a trauma response, you, you when you feel hurt and upset by something, your, your trauma response happens. You have a way to separate, process that, heal it, calm it down, and then show up again at work, not delivering them your trauma response, but your solution, whether that's to leave, defend yourself, um, advocate for yourself, you know, <laughs> quiet quit. Yeah, I, quiet quitting sounds terrible to me. What a, what a waste of life that is. If you're going to work, make the most of it. That's my philosophy. Okay. Number seven is you haven't learned to manage your trauma symptoms. So to hide them, you're keeping your life small. All right. So I talk about a lot about like playing small, right? So your trauma symptoms, when you, before you have any recovery, they mess up everything. They ruin your opportunities. They make you look foolish, sad, crazy. <laughs> you know, they, they thwart you from getting what you want. So one way you can control your trauma symptoms is by keeping your life small. Don't go for jobs that are challenging. Don't be around people. Be alone. Do something really unchallenging in isolation. Those are, I mean, that's what we do, right? I'm not really exaggerating. That's what we do. We're just doing jobs that are so easy or so repetitive that you can just do that. Now, I think, I think an easy, repetitive job can be very therapeutic when you're in a certain place, but it's not suitable for your whole life. It's not suitable. And just like isolating, sometimes you, got, you need some time alone, but isolating for your whole life is not a great idea. And yes, yes, I hear the chorus of people who say, no, it's great. Isolating's great. I really don't want to do it. But you're so busted because you watch my videos. So I know you're working on yourself and I'm teaching you about relational stuff. So even if you're a person who loves solitude, learning this relational stuff is powerful and good stuff and hang in there. There are, there are aspects of life. And if you don't believe me now, when you're old and you need some help to uh, take care of yourself or you're sick, you will see what I'm saying about the, how important it is to have people in your life. It's important. This is a big one. We could talk on and on and on about this. Number eight is emotional dysregulation. All right. This is probably the number one thing that gets in the way of of your advancement because emotional dysregulation rings you out. It can leave you with something very similar in your body to a hangover because you were crying all night or you were having a big argument the night before. 
And when you have drama in your private life, it can leak into your work life. So even if you keep it all together at work, like I, I think I was pretty good at that. I, I think I would lash out sometimes, but the drama I was having in my private life was showing up in my face and in the time I arrived at work and my bedraggled persona. Like I said, our nervous systems are, are connected. And so people could tell I was in great distress and they were kind and supportive of me, but they did not promote me. So I really, I really did work with mostly very kind people, but I couldn't get ahead and use my talents because I just could not keep out of the terrible problems that I was having on my own time. So emotional re-regulation, this is going to be your friend no matter what part of your life you're working on right now, your work, your relationships, your parenting, your neighbors, you know, all of it will require emotional re-regulation. I'm going to talk about that in a second. But what you really need, because because all that dysregulation, it takes your productivity and you have these bursts of productivity and then it goes down. It's like a roller coaster, right? Productivity like a roller coaster. So sometimes you can get away with that and there's some types of work where bursts is sufficient that you can come in and just like deliver like crazy. Some people are very, very good at creating order out of a bunch of papers or processes and that's a gift too. So there are many gifts and you can never really be 100% certain that you have exactly this one, but your job is to start noticing where is that feedback that what you do benefits others. You get to do a lot of things just for yourself. You have a lot of talents and skills, but the gift is the thing that connects you to your greater purpose to be of service to this world in the best possible way. And you'll be clumsy with it and you won't have it right initially. Like you'll be on a path all your life to go towards what it is. Some people are very lucky and they find it early. It took me a long time. I'm living it right now and what I'm doing right now. And it just is so much happier. There's so much more abundant energy every day to do it because it just feels like what I'm made to do. And everybody is deserves to have that healing trauma is essential for you to discover that in yourself so whatever you do for a living and when, when i was first learning this i saw a parking lot attendant um, they weren't even the attendant they were the guy who sweeps the parking lot and just gets the fallen leaves out of it and they were so kind and uplifting and it was at a hospital i i had a long period where i was in and out of the hospital and i would enjoy so much seeing this parking lot guy because he was kind and friendly to me and he would sort of help me change my, I think he might've been a healer actually. <laughs> I'd be going into the hospital for some dreadful thing. I'm, I'm fine now, but I'd be going in and he'd be like, Hey, how's it going? <laughs> and there was this funny way he sort of changed my whole attitude to like, I'm so grateful that I have healthcare to deal with this problem. My whole attitude would change. He wouldn't lecture me. He didn't say it. He just emanated it. And through working in a parking lot, which I'm sure was not the best paid job, uh, he exhibited joy and optimism that was transmissible. And I received that. I met a lot of really gifted people in, when I was in and out of the hospital. But if you've ever been in the hospital, they, they don't all have that. <laughs> it can be rough sometimes. Some people are just like mean. <laughs> They're mean and they don't care. <laughs> I don't know. There's a, there's a, it's a mixed bag out there, but my, my growth in healing is where I stopped focusing so much on how somebody was mean once to me in the hospital, or well, more than once, okay, and more on... I admire these people so much. I want to be like that. I want to develop the things in myself where I'm that person for somebody else. And they start to have that experience of having their attitude lifted because of some incidental contact with me, even when I don't know I'm doing it. Like, wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be wonderful? This topic is huge. How do you work and have a career and actually advance in your career, even though you have PTSD symptoms from childhood? Past trauma can really block your ability to handle yourself and take the necessary actions that anyone needs to take if they're going to pursue a professional dream that involves staying productive and working with other people, which frankly can be hard for us. Because just about all jobs and all professional accomplishments involve that productivity and connecting with people. So here are some major areas that I recommend you work on healing so that you can enjoy and advance in your career. All right, number one, you'll need to heal the tendency to wear the harshness of your past or of the present, like on your sleeve. Do you know that saying, like you just show it to the world? 
So you wouldn't want to be talking about the past all the time. You wouldn't want to be using it as your identity or bragging about it. Like it was so bad for me, everybody. I know very well how this can be a problem because I grew up like welfare poor and I had parents who were incredibly brilliant. My mom, my dad, my stepdad, the problems in the family, mostly stemming from alcoholism actually, and some of the members, it absolutely crushed my parents' lives. They were all highly educated, but they were frustrated. We were poor most of the time and there was a world of trouble and grief because of their struggle. And that's the background where I grew up. And like so many of you, I was determined that I would never be like them. I would be different. And in some ways I was, I didn't become an alcoholic probably through no great virtue, but because of luck of the genetic draw, I was a great student. I was intelligent, but mostly I didn't have any supervision from parents. So when it was time to go to college, I had no idea how to go there. I walked into the admissions office at the University of Arizona in August of the year after I got out of high school, and I found out for the first time that you were supposed to apply and that you needed to take the SAT test. So that first semester, I went to community college and I cleaned houses to support myself. In the spring semester, I got into the U of A, but I had no idea how the whole thing worked or how I was supposed to support myself. You know, and eventually I figured it out. I became a good student. And if that's all it took to have a good career, I would have been fine. But my problems went way beyond education. I had terrible self-esteem and I had trouble dealing with people. I was always in conflicts. Well, not always, but often in conflicts. And I'd make some new best friends and then the friendships would blow up. And this happened in my romantic life too, which really damaged the energy that I brought to work. And so these are some of the ways that people with trauma can wear their past on their sleeve. It, it, it just comes with you into the job. Another way that you could be wearing it on your sleeve, not that you mean to, but maybe you dress too shabbily. Maybe that your the way you dress reflects low self-esteem or poverty consciousness. And it's not your fault that you grew up poor and most people in the world are poor, but if you're trying to move up in the world, you know, the it's just really good advice that you would want to dress the part. And so putting energy into that, maybe you didn't learn it at home, but it's a good thing to do now. Another thing in this, in that category of wearing your trauma on your sleeve is, uh, it's time to become mindful about how much you disclose to people about yourself, not just about your past and the trauma and, you know, oh, I was abused. You don't necessarily want to bring that out very early in a friendship with somebody but also self-disclosing about, um, you know, what's going on at home right now or how much traffic there was or how sick you are or what the symptoms were because I wasn't very consciously parented. My parents knew how to act with people, I think, but I was sort of feral and I didn't know. And I would often go to work and I would just be talking about problems and how much I resented people in the office. And I was just, you know, I was just, I was sort of an open book, but not in a good way. And it stigmatized me. So another thing would be, you kind of almost brag about how bad things used to be in the past, just so that people will think that you're interesting or worthy, right? There's, there's an element in our culture where we sort of, we make victims into heroes only because they were victims. And it is heroic. It's a big deal to come up from a difficult past and to be working in a job. But it's appropriate to measure out how much you say about what that past is and not try to wear it like a badge of honor. Um, all by itself. You know, you still, just like everybody there, you kind of have to prove yourself. You have to learn skills. You have to get along with people and you have to get things done. That's kind of what jobs generally expect, right? All right. So the second big area, a big trauma symptom area that you're going to need to heal to succeed at work is to deal with a, the tendency to underfunction. Now, some of us are overfunctioners and some are underfunctioners. And, and, and I'll tell you what exactly that is in a minute, but People who overfunction, who do too much, who like stay too late, or burn the midnight oil, burn themselves out, get really mad later that nobody reciprocated how much they're putting into a job or a relationship or something. With overfunctioning, there's often the big productivity crash that comes along and you know, you can't you can't stay with it. So you set this expectation, hey, I can do everything, I'm heroic, and and then you can't. Underfunctioning is sometimes the consequence of overfunctioning for a period of time, or for some people, it's just like their basic speed. So underfunctioning includes things like 
having a really hard time focusing for a long period of time, you know, being restless at work, um, jumping on the internet, just can't really, uh, you know, can't really focus enough, being unreliable, not showing up on time for things where people were counting on you, or even worse, lying about the fact that you did it or make, you know, making up a fake story about why you didn't show up on time or not even admitting that you, <laughs> there's like lying. And then there's pretending that it's not a problem. You know, if you didn't show up for something where people were counting on you personally, that's my pet peeve. I don't like it when people lie or don't admit like it's, if they just say I made a mistake, <laughs> I'm like, all right, I make mistakes. I get it. But if they're just like, yeah, but it was because of, you know, traffic or something. And I'm like, I drove here too. I know it's not traffic or they just don't even acknowledge. Sorry, I'm late. Here's a little trick, by the way. When you come into a business meeting and you did have to be late, instead of coming in, this is, it's very disruptive for the meeting. When you come in late to a meeting and people are already working, a person whose trauma is just hanging all over them comes in and goes, Hey, I'm here. Oh my God, the traffic. Oh, I was trying to get here. And I thought, Oh, and I was going to call, but I couldn't call. And uh, that energy is really disruptive and calls a lot of attention to the fact that you're late. Here's what you can do when you're late. You come in very quietly. Just don't let the door bang, you know, be quiet and come in and say, sorry, I'm late and sit down, get out something to write on and start paying attention. You need not explain. If somebody asks you, maybe you can explain. Personally, I recommend experimenting with telling the truth about things. It holds you accountable for what's going on and allows you to make some positive changes in your life. All right, the third big symptom area of childhood PTSD that needs to be healed for you to succeed at work is a tendency to feel overwhelmed, like so overwhelmed that you can't even begin. You can't begin the work. Now I get this. I get very overwhelmed. That's a PTSD thing I have. And I have a whole system. I have a morning routine that helps me start the day with a one foot in front of the other approach rather than just a big, oh, the day, the day I wake up like that. It's like an emotional flashback. My emotional flashbacks, that's a trauma thing. They're like this. I wake up and I'm like, it's been going on like in my dreams at night. I have dysregulation dreams even. And so I wake up sometimes in all this distress. It's like, oh, I have so much to do. I have so much to do. And why is it me? Why is it me? I have to do everything. So that's an emotional flashback. When I start thinking that if I don't stop it and start using my tools to come back and go, I don't have to do everything. I only have to do it one thing at a time. I can only do them, uh, you know, in a certain order. I'm going to make a list of what that order is and the best I can and start tackling it. To do that, I start with my morning routine, which always begins. I go get something to drink and I do my daily practice. And that's a specific writing technique followed by a specific meditation technique. Very simple, shockingly effective to help move that emotional flashbacky mind, those distressed hamster wheel thoughts of like, oh my God, I got to do so much. I got to do so much. That's, how, that's the shape that my complex PTSD takes. And untreated, it just turns me into a nervous wreck who's angry, who's ineffective, who's isolated because those, the angry and angry part is very offensive to other people. So instead, I make room in my mind for inspiration, creativity, ideas, and action by using these techniques. And if you ever want to learn those, they're always below all my videos, the daily practice. It's a free course. I think something like half a million people have taken it now. And that makes me so happy because it's really helpful. And the only way to find out if it helps you is to try it. So the overwhelm um, begins with, I get my mind in order with the racing thoughts and get the fearful and resentful thoughts out of my mind and onto paper. When I'm done with my daily practice, I take a shower, I go get my breakfast, and then I sit down and I work my to-do list. And I use an online tool for that. Lots of people have different ones. I use this thing called Kanban Flow, K-A-N-B-A-N Flow. It's, um, it's a free app, about, although I have a paid version, it's $5 a month or something. And it's a little structure where I can click and drag tasks into columns and I color code them and I plan each day of what I'm going to do. And I always put way too much in. And then at the end of the day, I can move them over into the next day or sort of rearrange the tasks ahead of me. And I love this tool. It's got a little timer built in 
and I can, it'll say, I click the timer, it says click on a task and I go, oh, I'm going to, you know, prep the intros to five videos or something. So I put that and I time that like five videos, that's like an hour and a half for me, right? If I, if I already know what the letters are, I've picked the letters, but I'm going to prepare the introductions and sort of think through and what's the, what's the download I'm going to recommend at the end. I put some thought into that. Okay, hour and a half. Hour and a half for me is this like green color. <laughs> half an hour is yellow. <laughs> And two hours is blue. So I have the whole color system of how long something takes and then I can sort of see my day. But I click on the task I'm going to do and then I start a timer. And I've got my timer set at 25 minutes. It's called the Pomodoro method. Pomodoro is the Italian word for tomato and legend has it, the person who invented this technique um, was using a timer shaped like a tomato. Pomodoro. <laughs> and, and I do that 25 minutes. So uh, like sometimes I try to freelance it and just get productive all by myself without a timer. And sometimes I am, and sometimes I'm not. I get very, you know, I work on a computer and also on my computer is this very interesting thing called the internet. And it's, hard to resist going in there and go, oh, what's happening on YouTube today? How's the stats there? What are the comments and Twitter and, and, you know, Facebook? Oh, somebody wants something. And next thing you know, I can't even remember what I intended to work on literally. And you probably have the same thing. Like I'm not being shocking here. I have that. I don't have ADHD. I'm very capable of focusing but I need tools. And so setting a timer, it goes off after 25 minutes and I shut down tabs. I shut down notifications for that period of time. And I just do that thing for 25 minutes. And it's in, it's really powerful if I can get started with a set of tasks that way. Being able to get things done is my superpower. I, I have so many like CPTSD traits that make it hard, but the reason I've been able to make a living in my life mostly, and certainly for the past 23 years, as a self-employed person, it's because I'm really good. I, I can see what needs to be done and I can do it. And I used to do it for clients and now I do it for crappy childhood fairy. And I just have this very honed ability to go in and go, let's see, where are we? Where are we trying to get? What do we need to do? I have a, a big picture view of things. I'm good at that. Analytical thinking. And people have different strengths and that's that one's one of mine. So I can see what to do. And I used to be very helpful to my um, consulting clients because I'd look at a project and then I would think through, here's where we need to be. Here's what you need to do. And I would send them an email with this beautiful list of questions and action items. And that's like my dream is that I have somebody like me who helps me do that now that I'm always like, you know, out there leading crappy childhood fairy. So staying organized, it's not, it's not natural to me because of my trauma. And I'm very good at it because of my ability to use tools. That's what I'm trying to get at. So that's overwhelm as something that keeps a person in under functioning. Another one is a tendency to favor doing grunt work, work for which you're gravely overqualified rather than going for more challenging or higher paid roles because you get so triggered that your CPTSD symptoms come out that trying to stick your neck out or try something hard for you is too much. You can learn to bring that back down, but that's a sign that you're under functioning. If you're doing work where you're like, people don't even have any idea, like I don't belong here, but we put ourselves there. We will often perceive ourselves as having no choice, but I'm, ge I'm making this video to try to talk to that part of you that knows that deep down inside there is a choice and it might take some preparation and some courage and some work on healing your CPTSD symptoms so you can do it. But with more healing, you can take greater risks and put yourself out there and do the sort of job that you really can do, the, the one that gives you joy and that pays adequately. I want that for everybody. All right. Another way that we underfunction is not asking for what we want. Do you do that? Where instead of saying, hey, you know what? Uh, I want to have a promotion or I want to stop working in this part of the company and I want to work in that one, or I don't want to deal with this unpleasant person anymore. And we just think, oh, I have to put up with this. I can't, you know, make a fuss because again, I can't deal with how triggered I get around it. You might not even be consciously having that thought. But if you can't manage your CPTSD triggers and you get dysregulated and upset about things that set off your nervous system into CPTSD symptoms, you have to make your life small. Everything depends on learning to calm your triggers, not trying to make everybody else not trigger you. You can never really make that happen, but learning to calm your response to triggers until they're barely even triggers anymore. And then your life starts getting a lot bigger. 
that's under-functioning. The thing about over-functioning, the opposite is like doing things for other people that they can do for themselves, trying to do more than your share, trying to prove yourself to the boss by like, look, I did 27 things for you instead of the one thing you asked. The problem with that is that if it's not rewarded, which it usually wouldn't be if it's not asked for, maybe, I don't know, but if it's not rewarded, it goes into resentment. The over-functioning isn't like a genuine expression of yourself. It's a strategy to dance around and try to get somebody to like you and think you're good enough. So that's also like a CBTSD symptom to do that. We don't want to either over-function or under-function. There's a time for each, like in vacation, maybe you under-function. When there's a big deadline, you over-function, but you don't want to be a person who's stuck in one gear or the other, all right? The third area of CPTSD symptoms that can really get in the way of your career growth is getting dysregulated on the job. Now, you can learn to re-regulate, and it will make all the difference, and I can just like that has been my experience and it was very quick that I began to change when I learned to identify that I was dysregulated and I used my tools to re-regulate. And again, that's the daily practice course I teach. It's down in the description section. I recommend that you take this need to master re-regulation very seriously. If you get dysregulated, and by dysregulated, I mean a nervous system reaction to stress that people with trauma often get, which leads you to feel discombobulated, numb, emotionally kind of on a roller coaster, like your anger is too much or your sadness is too much or you're too excited about something. It's emotional dysregulation. If you get sick a lot, a lot of chronic diseases with no origin, that could be dysregulation. Inability to focus or learn, uh, inability to read the room, like you walk in and you can't really tell what's going on with people. All of that can be dysregulation and dysregulation has now turned out to be the core symptom that drives so many other trauma symptoms. So if you get dysregulated, you have everything to gain by learning to re-regulate and mastering it on the job and outside of the job. Dysregulation is the reason why you may be getting those productivity crashes where you get some sort of accomplishment, you put yourself out there, you get some accolades or and then, you know, somebody says one little critical word and zoom, you go back down dysregulated people are really capable of accomplishing things, but they have a harder time sustaining just kind of a steady progress. There's these crashes of productivity. And if you have those, you may have been trying to hide them on the job, pretending you're sick, not really knowing what's wrong. Before I had healing for my complex PTSD, I would say when something really good happened or I got recognized for something, a promotion or, you know, in my personal life, like somebody I really liked asked me out, something like that, I could have a productivity crash for three days easily. And to this day, if I get really, really upset about something, I can have another productivity crash. If I get dysregulated badly, I, it takes a certain amount of time to recover my re-regulation. So if you, and this is after 29 years of having skills for this, you can think of how it used to be for me. I mean, I just went months where I could barely read a paragraph. I would read it over and over again. I was faking it. Once I was a passenger in a car and I, I had a cup of coffee, like a ceramic mug in my hand, and I can't remember what I was talking about with somebody, but what they said made me mad. And I just threw the cup out the window and the cup smashed. And I remember they pulled the car over and they started crying. It was so upsetting to them. And I was so dysregulated that I didn't predict that that would even affect them, that I smashed a cup out the window. It was just this weird, reckless, rough thing to do. And not coincidentally, it was something that my parents used to do is like break dishes when they were upset. It was in there. So through my daily practice and through re-regulation, I've started to kind of let those old imprints of how to deal with feelings and you know, lashing out like that, that it started to be rinsed off of me and washed downstream in the experience of my life. And then a new strength comes up inside where I have some balance and some calm inside to draw on when things are rough. And things get rough sometimes. Getting dysregulated at work can also cause you to sort of come off as hostile and intimidating and difficult. And <laughs> Unfortunately, if you have CPTSD and it's active and you haven't yet developed a way to sort of do a self-examination and get some support from somebody who totally cares about you, like maybe a buddy in my daily practice program or a sponsor in 12 Steps, somebody you trust to sort of when you can go, is it just me? Like, should I be really angry right now? It really helps to get a second opinion from trusted people because if you're coming off as very, very difficult, 
Even if people are obliged by law to treat you fairly, it's not fair to them that they would have to work with somebody who's causing so much anxiety. So I'm just going to ask you to look at it that way. It's very difficult to work with somebody who's leading with anger, who's leading with conflict, who's getting emotionally dysregulated on the job and sort of triggering and drawing off of the, the peaceful well that anybody else has managed to develop. The best way forward, if a job is really terrible and it makes you so angry all the time because it's a bad place for you to work, I encourage you to change jobs. Like nobody's coming to save you on this. If you want to work in a better environment, it is time for you to start putting your ducks in a row so you can make that change. And if you're choosing to stay in the environment, you may need to assess as difficult things happen, you know, wait a minute, you know, am I being mistreated here? Should I just let it go? Should I just show up and be a good sport? Like these are the improvisational decisions that we make day after day after day, especially when we're out in the world dealing with people. As you heal your dysregulation, you'll have good judgment about it. You'll have good judgment and you'll have equanimity, magnanimity. This is where you can be just sort of like, kind and easy going with people when they're edgy with you. And often you can be the one who sort of heads off a big conflict of just like, we're cool. Okay. Not being a doormat. There's, it's a fine line, isn't it? And this is where people with uh, childhood PTSD can get so jammed up is there is a conflict. Somebody's not being quite right. They're off in some way. You need to set a boundary. You want to be kind about it. You don't want to be a doormat. And this is where we get very confused. So again, I recommend daily practice to help move the stress thoughts downstream so you can have clear thoughts and lucid decisions about like what to do about the little things that happen every day. And you will be surprised what a, how quickly your life goes from a trajectory that's kind of uh, not going that well to a trajectory that is going so much better because of these little decisions along the way. The little decisions where you kind of handle it, you handle it. You're the reliable person. You're the sturdy person. You're the person with boundaries who says no to mistreatment without a big bunch of fireworks about it. It's just a boundary. I remember I used to run a video production company and I meditate every day, twice a day. And one of those meditations is somewhere around four or five in the afternoon. And when you do video production, sometimes you can't, you know, the schedule demands that you keep working quite long into the evening. But I knew, and I had the privilege because I owned the company of just like, I need to meditate or I'm going to start getting grumpy, unfocused, hostile, intimidating, you know, all those things. And I know that I do that in it and it brings me back into, you know, lucidity and kind of a, a, a goodness of heart and a clear mind. And that's exactly how I want to be doing all my work always. And so I would just be like about five o'clock, I'm going to have us all take a break. I'm going to go meditate. And I set a boundary on that. And people were just like, okay, Anna has to meditate. And I had spent years missing my evening meditation when I was working because I was afraid that I couldn't ask for it or I couldn't try it. And so I just put that out there. You may not own your company right now or have that privilege, but you may be surprised that when you set boundaries in a way that's not um, trying to put any responsibility on other people, but just like going, I have this thing I need to do. It's now nine in the morning. And when it gets to be that time, I'm going to need a break to do that. So are we good? Are we good? And then maybe you need to be a little flexible about it, but you get to do the things that help you stay in the frame of mind where you can advance in your career and not just that's because I'll tell you at five o'clock, if I'm not writing and meditating and the stress of video production, if I didn't do it, I turned into the kind of person who did not get another job from the client. I'll say that. <laughs> so it became totally important that I care for myself. Anyway, it surprised me. People were very glad for me to take care of myself. And not only did they tolerate it, but they respected me for it. They started asking me, so how do you meditate? Where did you learn to do that? Like it became intriguing to them that somebody took care of themselves right in front of them. All right, a sub area again of dysregulation on the job is it makes it very hard to deal with criticism and there's just no way around it. Like if you're going to grow on the job, you have to be open to some level of people telling you how you maybe made a mistake or how you need to do it better. It can also make you vague about discussions of money. It's easy to walk into a job and go, um, so, yeah, I'd like to do the job and then be like, oh, I should have asked for how much money. I just have no idea. And if you are not somebody who can 
be comfortable talking about money and own what it is you require, then you are very unlikely to get what you want or deserve. And so dysregulation makes that sort of decision to be able to be honest about what it is you're looking for and not, not playing any games, but just saying, I need to be paid this much or this job isn't going to work for me. To be able to do that with peace in your heart is what re-regulation looks like. Not to be like, oh, I'm all, I'm preemptively so angry. I never get what I want. You know, oh, here we go. I'm not, oh no, I can't say anything. It's going to come out wrong. It's stupid. I don't, fine. I'll just not say anything. You don't want to be that person. The other thing that you can get very vague about that can really create problems on the job and dysregulation, this is a big way that dysregulation sabotages people, is you get vague about sexual boundaries. So if you are getting sexually harassed, or let's say that a coworker and you have, you know, an attraction going and you're hanging out after work and you don't really know, like, is this a date? Is this an attraction? Is this okay at work? Um, are we going to talk about this? All that stuff to get vague about it at work is so shooting yourself in the foot. Work is a place where you need to be very, very clear about where you're coming from and you need to be clear where other people are coming from. And I know that it is a tricky dance to be able to clarify these things, that you could really put people on the spot, you could make them feel threatened, maybe you're not ready to do that yet. But I urge you, do not get vague about your boundaries, about sex, attraction, hanging out with people who you think maybe are hitting on you. That is some place to say, and this is where being re-regulated helps. You can just say, oh, thanks. This feels like a date. I wouldn't want to do that. You can say it in the nicest way so that if there's any hope that you can set your boundary without the other person freaking out, which is what bad people do, right? When they're confronted with boundaries, it happens at work, obviously. But if you possibly can, you set your boundaries in the nicest possible way so that you're not part of any conflict. And most people will say, oh, yeah, yeah, that's not where I was coming from. And the whole thing evaporates. Even in your personal life, if you have vague and confusing relationships with people where you're like, is this a date or is this kind of, are we flirting? Is it, are you cheating on your spouse? Like what's going on here? where you don't know, there's a magic power that you always have with you and it's honesty. When there's like magic pixie dust all over everything, like, I don't know, we're just not gonna say anything about what's really going on here because it will ruin the moment or I'll feel embarrassed or then you'll know or it'll become obvious that this is not sustainable. Like those are things that we do when we have trauma wounds. This is also what people do in limerence is keep it vague, keep it vague because to have it be concrete would be to have it be something that you must say no to. It's not real. It's not legitimate. You will get rejected. So, so we keep it vague and we get too good at that. But that is the kind of thing that will bite you in the butt at work. You do not want to be vague about these things. The ideal scenario though is where you hold your boundaries at work. You don't get too into it with people. If you have to explain yourself, you're already losing your boundary. If you have to, you can go to your support people outside of work to process the emotions and have a cry and deal with all the feelings that come up around it. The fourth trauma zone that can come and hold back your advancement at work is the other people in your life. Um, usually it would be a partner who are just messed up enough to sabotage the impression you make at work. And that could be everything from the controlling and abusive partner at home. It could be people who continue to have drama in their own life and you get calls all the time and you have to take them to the emergency room. or. You have a home life that you invest a lot of energy into hiding from people at work, and that may be appropriate, but when it's draining your energy all the time of what's going on at home, you know, maybe you have a partner with an addiction, maybe you have a marriage that's falling apart, maybe you have a kid who's in great difficulty, and I know how complicated those situations can be, but I, I would be leaving something big out if I didn't acknowledge that having tr troubled people in your home life can sabotage you at work. So I hope you can do everything you need to do to have a little bit of separation from that. Um, coming to work with what I call an emotional hangover. You know, I never was much of a drinker, but I would get into such emotional scrapes and difficulties with people that I would come to work late with a terrible migraine, looking awful, having cried all night, eyes all puffy. And it was functionally, I had to admit, like being an alcoholic, like being an alcoholic with a hangover. And it used to happen too much. 
because of the kinds of relationships that I had before I had trauma healing and when I still didn't know how to get re-regulated. One of the, oh gosh, it's just such a relief now in post-healing life. I, I talk about it like it's all done. I mean, so much progress. Luckily, it continues. So I don't even know where it's going next. But I wake up in the morning every day, okay. <laughs> and it's a, it's, it's a great asset to being able to um, open up my heart and my life to new opportunities and things that are hard for me. Like everything that I've ever done as crappy childhood fairy, at some point it was new, like putting my first video up on YouTube. It took so much courage. And um, I'm working on a book now and I have an agent and trying to do all of that is like, again, like it takes courage. I could never do it if I had an emotional hangover as often as I used to. So that's another reason. Like so many people with complex PTSD, my early career looked a lot like a roller coaster with great accomplishments and then big descents, giving up, quitting things, crashing and burning. And it wasn't just productivity, but it had a lot to do with people who I chose as partners. And twice I ended up with, with men who had active, serious drug addictions. In both cases, I didn't realize it at first. In, uh, one of them had a relapse after a couple years into the relationship. One of them had been secretly using the whole time. And it was absolutely devastating to, to my career both times. Both times, my career derailed. It was very stigmatizing to me. There was no way I could continue to hide it. We're talking serious drugs and terrible consequences of what happened to them. When I started to have boundaries about who got into my life, which involved making a decision that it was okay with me if I was single forever, a single mom at that point, I'd be single forever, but I would never again have that level of drama of an active addict in my life. My career couldn't help but go up because I stopped having this crazy intense drama going on all the time. And so if you've never had a drama-free life and been able to go to work like that with your own optimism or energy, or maybe you don't like the job that day, but just to basically have your wits and your emotions in their little cubby holes <laughs> when you arrive at work, you're going to be so pleasantly surprised how much energy and bandwidth you have that's all for you to be able to accomplish what you want. It's fantastic. That is one of the gifts of healing. All right. A fifth way trauma area that will stop you from getting ahead at work is choosing jobs and bosses who match your terrible family of origin, right? How many times have you done that? Like constantly brings out the worst in you when you do that. Like you may be able to get a lot of healing with your parent, but there's a reason why we get some distance from those toxic dynamics. And if you're not healed yet, you will have a tendency to choose bosses and coworkers and work environments that have some sort of like mimicking yuckiness about them, like what you grew up with. So for me, I would say the bosses, I, I've had some good bosses. I haven't had a boss in like 23 years, but I had clients. And one of the hardest things that I kept getting into was clients or bosses with significant drinking problems like my mom, drugs and alcohol problems. And I get around that energy and it's like kryptonite where I feel very angry. I feel shut down. I feel very snippy. I'm not pleasant and I'm not very visionary. And it's, it ends up using up about 60% of my vital force, you know, just to cope with somebody who's high. And it's not good for me. I don't want to be around it. I, it's just one of those things I had to make a conscious decision. I will not work with people who I feel are drunk or high and ugh, so many bad memories there. And the other thing, the other negative tendency that I um, would tend to gravitate towards is bosses who really underestimated me. Now, being a consultant is nice. When you're freelancing, they think highly enough of you to employ you, and it may not last forever. You may not get a second job with them, but if it's spread out a little bit, you get to really like work on your professional skills without falling into a, a parent-child relationship with your boss. And I think there's a subtle way of doing that. I sometimes, I get letters from people or I've coached people where they're like, my boss invalidates me, you know, my boss plays favorites and I'm just like, oh, bad situation, bad situation. Sometimes I think the only thing for it is to get out of a job like that. Sometimes healing is possible, but if you're dealing with a dynamic that you grew up with and you're not very far along your, your path of healing your trauma symptoms, 
being around the stuff that hurt you in the first place can just really take you down. So I recommend making a conscious decision about the kind of boss and coworkers that would be good for you and seeking it out and being willing to take the time to find that. And I know, I mean, look, I started in this video telling you I had to clean houses while I was young, you know, just to get by. I, I've had all kinds of jobs that were hard and that I just had to do for money. And I know, I know it's like that, but we're all, we're all hoping for something a little better, right? We want to get onto where we feel fulfilled, where we're using our talents and gifts, where we're getting paid well enough to be financially okay. That's a very nice thing to have. It feels good to do the absolute best job you can do. And um, one way, one thing that comes as a shock to people is that when you're in a job and you work for a boss or a company or a project, your job is to make that entity, that person, that organization, that group as successful as you can. So when you're in a, like a parent dynamic with the parent who hurt you, your objective becomes something very different than, you know, making them successful. And that may sound very self-sacrificing to you. It's not. When you make your boss successful, you rise up. If your boss doesn't recognize that that's valuable and reward you, either it's not a place that has a, has a better place for you, or it's not a place that's willing to give that to you. And that's not a good environment. So if I had my whole career to do over again, and what I tell my coaching clients is be brave about envisioning a step forward, a step up, a step out. And if you can't get it from where you are right now, then you have to do the very triggering and dysregulating act of finding something new and quitting the old job. But you can now do that without a big conflict or fireworks or rancor, that it's just a positive step that people take and it's okay and you deserve it. And when you learn to master re-regulation from your dysregulation, it becomes natural. Be sure you surround yourself with people who get it, that you have people with whom you can be honest. At first I had this in 12-step uh, programs, then I started to have it around people who had complex PTSD. And that's one thing I love about our membership program is like everybody's working on this stuff. Everybody's kind of working off the same playbook about how to do it. Everybody's hopping on Zoom together. Our members create their own Zoom calls to do the daily practice together. They have buddy relationships. Anyway, I was turning into an ad for that. But if you really wanted to be around people who are walking this path of improving their lives, come check it out. Uh, there's a link always down below in the description section for my membership program or on my website. So with that, I wish you well. I wish you every bit of freedom from the oppression and suppression of the past, what people did to you, and the ways that you've held yourself back since then too. So that the best in you, so that everything you're capable of can come forward and shine. It's not just because that's what will make you happy. It's because we need you. The world depends on all of us becoming our full and real selves and to be able to bring our best to everything we do. If you'd like to take a quick step to launch your healing, I would recommend a free download I have called One Year to Heal. It's a thought exercise. Of course, you have more than a year to heal. But if you had to do it in a year, how would you do it? And this is the exercise I've created for you. Click here and I will see you very soon. Your life is important. And if trauma from the past is still affecting you and holding you back, it's so, so vital that you heal this. Not just so that you can feel happier, even though it's very important that you're happy. It's important to heal because getting free of trauma may be the very thing you need to liberate your gifts. Your gifts are the unique abilities you have that the world needs. And if you've been feeling like no matter what you do, you keep feeling empty and your life is meaningless and the world has ripped you off and life is passing you by, I'm just gonna say it, you might be locked out of your gifts. It could be that you're doing the wrong thing or it could be that you're not seeing the possibilities right in front of you, but you know on some level that you're meant to be doing something more than you are right now. Trauma really gets in the way of that. But the knowledge that you are meant for more, it lives in your mind just like your gift lives in your being, in your potential. Your gift is needed and you may just be walking around having no idea what it is, or you may think you know what it is, but maybe you're wrong. That can happen. And we gotta look at this because 
I believe it's impossible to be truly fully happy until you're running on all six cylinders using everything you've got to, yes, make a living, of course, but also do something great for the benefit of others. I'm Anna Runkle, also known as the Crappy Childhood Fairy, and today I'm going to read a letter from someone I'll call Jane, who's having a miserable time trying to make it as an artist. And she says, Dear Anna, can you speak to the issues an artist faces? The nature of the work is so isolating, and one can get thrown off easily if the work isn't going well. A lot of artists ask the question, why, with overconsumption in the universe, are artists living in basements? She says, I know my art lives a dead-end life in a damp, dark space. Hmm. So few artists are ever shown and given opportunities. Making a living is a struggle, and I'm tired of not being an equal to a white-collar worker. And forget Hollywood, I'm envious. There is a who-knows-who who aspect to even get your work exhibited. It seems to me I was given this talent and not the one I asked for, and often I wish it had been given a different skill set. Maybe you can discuss how to see this differently. Thanks. Looking for equality and peace, Jane. All right, thank you for that, Jane. Uh, this sounds <laughs> this sounds like a really hard place, and this may come as a tough love message. But your working conditions, the way that you feel so unrewarded and so stuck, are probably more limited by your own trauma and the pain that you carry than by the universe or how much people consume that you focused on, or capitalism or anything else outside yourself. It's the inside job, owning what you want in your life and taking back your own power to create your life, to do what you want to do, to leave things that you don't like. So you said that so few artists are ever shown and given opportunities. And yes, at a certain level, that's totally true. But actually, you don't have to wait for galleries to show you, show your work. I think if you choose to do art with the aim to get into like major galleries and be chosen and shown and funded, you're choosing this little tiny narrow path that is so easy to fail at. Because as you say, I, I, I believe you, it's a who knows who thing. It's, I don't even know, like what people are buying at that level, that very expensive level. You're actually choosing to go into that. And it's, you know, I don't, I don't want to sound like a discouraging parent here, but it's a, um, it's a self-hating choice if what you really want is to be creative, to be using this talent that you have, to be enjoying it, to be making money off of it. Now, one thing I would say is when we're talking about gifts, they are a little different than talents. And I'm not really sure if what you're describing is a gift. And because it makes you miserable, and because it's not finding people, I'm just sort of wondering if it's more something you enjoy, but not your gift. And I'm, I don't mean to, you know, that's, that's like not a bad thing, actually. Like a person's gift could be healing. You know, they might be healing people in one aspect of their life and making a living selling insurance. And that's perfectly good because, you know, it's good to make a living and um, some sort of uh, healing work might be unpaid, or they might have a gift for healing and they've figured out a way to make a perfectly good living at it. You know, they could end up being a, a clinician of some kind. And so I want to point your attention to that, that, that the thing that you love has many forms of expression and the idea that it has to meet the approval and payment and, and, and like validation of all these structures out there in the world. That's, I, it's a self-hating choice. It's a, it's you, you've disempowered yourself from being in charge of your own fate right there. And, um, and like you said, you admitted you have this envy, you know, you know, envy is one of the seven deadly sins. It's a, it's a terrible thing. And it cuts you off from the light, you know, from, from that power that you need to actually create anything at all. So envy, envy just, it kills you, I know you know this intellectually, you don't want to be comparing yourself to other people. You want to be getting more and more true to yourself. So just to, just to go back over some of the first points I've made here is, is your gift is something that 
is going to start feeling good to you. And it's something that is going to land with people. It's going to, a gift is yours for the purpose of benefiting others. You have many aspects to yourself. You might have a separate profession. You might have hobbies, you know, like I, I heal, but I also like to knit. I also like to raise frogs. <laughs> I really like TV. You know, you could have these talents and I happen to be incredibly good at accounting. Actually, I'm not talking about myself. I'm not good at accounting but I could be, and that doesn't mean it's my gift. It's, it could be a talent. I have a few talents. I have a pretty good singing voice, but I don't think singing is my gift. When I sing, basically nothing happens. When something happens for me is when I tell my story. I started doing that in like living room gatherings, and I began to notice that people got became spellbound when I told my story, and they started to say, oh, when you told me that story, I was so moved. So as I came to understand gifts, that's a sign. That's a sign. So with your art, Jane, when you do it, when you do it, whether people buy it or not, when you do your art, does it have an impact on people that in some way lifts them up, inspires them, makes things better for them or for the world? Does it do that? And again, this is not a judgment. I'm just, it's just a criteria to decide, is this a gift? So you self-described it as a talent and, but you were worried about having like saying, oh, I was given this talent and I didn't even want it. And I wish it was something else. You know what? Ignore the talent. I, I'm really talented at making spreadsheets. I don't want to do it for a living. I don't want to do it for other people. The older I get, the less I have to make Excel spreadsheets. Wahoo, right? If you don't like using your talent that much, if it's making you that miserable, let it go, let it go. You say you wish you had another another skill set. Well, I felt that way in 2008. <laughs> I had been working as a customer experience consultant. I enjoyed that work a lot, but when all my clients got laid off from their jobs, I didn't have any work. And there I had, I actually owned a house. I had two kids. I was a divorced single mom. I had to come up with a way to make some money. And so I thought sometimes necessity is the mother of invention, right? <laughs> and I had to think really quick, like, how am I going to do this? How could I, I thought about how much money I needed and it was way more than I made for per hour. And so I just thought it through. I did the math. What would I have to do to make the amount of money I need? And the thing that came to mind is that I used to know how to make videos. I used to study video production. I never really worked in it, but it was something I did as a hobby. And I made cold calls to 10 people I knew who worked in organizations that might hire somebody to make a video. And this was, this is 2008. It was really new to put videos on your website, but it could be done just, you know, like bandwidth was a big issue. YouTube is, had only been out like two, two years. And I said, Hey, I can make you a video to put on your website. And I think it would do amazing things to, you know, help educate your audience or sell whatever you're selling. I, I called just 10 people. I made, I, did, I made a decision. I'll call 10 people a day. I hate making cold calls, by the way. I hate making cold calls, <laughs> but I did it because I needed the money. <laughs> and um, I think that whole year I only made $11,000. I had to do something. And so so I, um, I got a podcast on how to make a cold call. I made some cold calls. I said, I'll do 10 a day. I did the research. I called 10 people. It was agony. You know, I just felt so stupid. Well, the next day, guess what? I had three video projects and one of them didn't pay anything. And one of them was a big drag. And one of them was a pretty decent video project with a university. And they ended up turning into a regular client. And then you know, I felt a little braver. And then I had, I actually had a video to put in my portfolio and I shared that with some more people that I knew who had jobs still. And then another one, I got another major client. And for like four or five years, I made videos for that organization. And I got to say, like, I had no idea what I was doing. Video had gone digital while I was not making video. And um, so I found somebody who kind of knew how to shoot and edit kind of, and we made so many mistakes together. We didn't understand about formatting or color correction and there were sound problems. And I used to just be like freaking out the whole time, very high stress, but I learned. And then um, 
the person who did the editing wasn't around and um, and the deadline was there. I, I forget. I can't even remember what happened. So really fast I had to learn to edit. And you know what I did? I googled, how do I edit video? And I had the software, but it was daunting back then. It was it was Final Cut 7. That's, that's what I bought. And it was really hard. I had never learned how to do it. So I knew somebody who knew it. She couldn't do the job, but I was just like, can you just show me really fast how to edit? And she showed me like five moves and then like all clunky on my laptop. I actually edited the video. I did it badly. I turned in the draft. I made the deadline. Later, the real editor came back. We, we saw it through. We got paid, you know, and I survived. I survived for another, you know, a few years later, actually, I was making pretty good money as a video producer. I had dozens of clients. I knew how to edit. I actually really, I like video editing, but I learned it by Googling it. And so long story for you, Jane, this is what I want to say. So my husband, he, he paints watercolors for pleasure. And, um, he decided that he wanted to take it seriously. And he started paying a few hundred dollars a month to go to an online school for it. And this online school, it organizes some really good teachers and they each are in their home studios. You know, there's, this is when this is the time of social distancing. They're in home studios and they've mounted four cameras, one on the ceiling, some on the sides. They've mounted their cameras and they're showing what they're doing. And some of them are like super shy and they're, but they're good. They're all good painters. You know, they were chosen and they're teaching watercolor painting and the school, the online school has an arrangement where they get, I don't know, half the money or something, some really good part of the money. The school gets part of the money for organizing the whole thing and marketing it to people. And it ends up being this fabulous way that painters can make money and it ends up being a way that somebody like my husband can get really fine, high level training and painting without going to art school. Cause you know what that costs a few hundred dollars a month. And he gets to watch all these videos and he gets live training. And for a little extra, he can have a consultation with one of the painters who will, you can take a picture of your work and send it in. So I'm just trying to tell you, Jane, like your picture of being limited and the world being against you and there's no opportunities and it's so unfair. I'm just like, you know what, this is your fear. And I say that with the utmost love because as crappy childhood fairy, this is what I deal in. I help people see that they're having fear and resentment and to get free of it because you free Jane, you free, you get to make art and you get to invent ways that you can bring it to people and get money for it. And I I've never seen your art, but I'm going to believe you. It's probably quite good, right? But you're waiting for other people to give you permission to sell it. It's not working. Pivot time, pivot time, take control back of your art. Between the internet and, and the public's incredible shift toward online, case, uh, online education, people like you and me have a huge opportunity to bring our art directly to people. I used to have to wait for permission from authorities and institutions too. I love this. Do you know Crappy Childhood Fairy? I started it with an idea and a laptop. I was taping my videos on my laptop. Then my teenage son, he had a little camera and he would you'll, go look at the early videos. They're, they're made by a teenager and it kind of shows. <laughs> and he helped me make them. And it was this really positive experience for us. And I put them up on YouTube. And many of you have heard the story. I put them on YouTube so that I could stream them into my blog. I thought my blog was going to be the thing. And I had, I don't know, you know, like 21 subscribers over there or something. <laughs> and one day I went over to YouTube to look at the videos and there were like a thousand subscribers. It was crazy. I had no idea. Like I was way more popular on YouTube than I was on the blog where I was putting in all the effort. And so the lesson here is when you're seeking for what it is you do and how to do it and where is the opening for you to do your wonderful thing, you just start doing it. You take little steps at a time. Every day you take a little action towards the thing you're trying to do. Completely open-minded that you might be going in the wrong direction, but that your experience blundering into that direction is actually going to teach you something. So I, I learned how to edit video because the person I brought in to do it for me flaked out and went away one day. You know, that's, I learned by necessity and I learned how to, how to put videos on YouTube and make things that would be useful to you. I mean, you, you know about me because of YouTube, right? I didn't even set out to be a YouTuber, but there it is. It started happening. And whereas I thought my gift might be, I had a hunch that it was something to do with writing about 
complex PTSD and teaching people the techniques that I had learned. I thought that's where it would go. I started opening my mouth on YouTube. People started watching. I, that benefit to other people started giving me energy to keep going and inspired me and directed me and gave me gave me that push to try to do something more and better. And I would now say it's it's actually the blog is fine. The blog is how some people like to consume the information. So cleaned up transcripts of my videos go there um, most weeks, <laughs> not even every week. But the videos is really where my gift comes alive and where I feel most like I'm connecting with people and being of service or trying to. It makes me so happy to actually be connected to people who can benefit from what I'm doing. And I think you need that, Jane. I think that's why it's feeling like you're in this terrible basement. Part of it is you don't have money. Part of it is, part of it is because you're not connecting with people and serving them in the way that you need to. If, if, if this is your gift, you need to be, to be somehow lifting other people up with it. You know, gifts are sometimes things like, you know, there's sometimes very unsexy things like administration. Some people have a gift for that. And if we didn't have them, nothing would get done. Some people have a gift for hospitality. They're, they just find that people are all over their house all the time. You know, there's, that's people just feel safe there or they feel, um, they, they feel like they can relax there. That's the gift of hospitality. So what you're looking for is the sign of where do people benefit? And I think that's a profound reorientation of your artwork rather than why haven't these people in a position to grant me visibility recognized me yet to how can I serve people and make their lives richer and happier somehow through my work. Because when you can do that, you're a lot more likely to be able to make money off your work as well. Okay. So I hope that helps you. That's my talk on gifts. <laughs> gifts are not always talents and it's not always how you make money, but it's really nice when there's some convergence there. And, um, I was able to leave my last job. I don't produce videos anymore. I just do this. And it is my great joy to be doing this. And believe me, it paid nothing for a very long time. It really just cost a lot of money. And now I do make a living off of it. Yay. Huh? So thank you. Thank you to everybody in YouTube land for making that possible. And I want for all of you to find your gifts too, and to start having that harmony between what you really have to bring to the world and your happiness and how you, how you get on with your day, what you, how you fill your time, how you make your money and keep a roof over your head. I hope that comes together for you. Jane, don't forget to stay connected to people. Connection is so important. If I've learned one thing as Krabby Childhood Fairy that I had previously overlooked, it's that everything that we do to heal only works when some connection is mixed into the weave there. There needs to be some connection as hard as it can be. If you took a poll and you had to name your five biggest triggers for trauma reactions, like feeling trapped, or humiliated or having an angry outburst. One of them, if you're like me, would be bad customer service. It's one thing when it's a restaurant or a retail shop where you have the option of never going there again, but when it's your mobile phone carrier or your gas and electric company or your bank or your health plan, where you're at the mercy of the other person to like not cut off your access to these things you need, if they then treat you in a way that's unfair or demeaning or in a way that humiliates you in front of other customers, that can be a huge trigger for complex PTSD symptoms. Have you ever really lost your cool in those situations, either as a customer or as the customer service worker? If one person tips over into emotional dysregulation or says something unkind, it's really common for the other person to get tipped over too. Both people will spend the next several hours in a dysregulated state and both people's families will likely find them stressed at the end of the day. And you can see how the, the ripple effect of one bad interaction can go on and on. But also if one of those people can turn around a bad interaction or prevent it or have a really positive customer service interaction, that also has a ripple effect on all the lives it touches. And that's what I want to talk about in this video. It's not just how bad customer service triggers CBTSD, but how good customer service can be a path of healing and even of joy. And I'm not exaggerating a path of healing old traumas and bringing happiness and joy, even when you're just busy 
buying groceries, or even when you're in jobs that are considered menial. It doesn't always happen, but there are things you can do to tip it in the right direction. You want to talk about this? Now, why do I know about this stuff? A little known fact is 15 or 20 years ago, I used to be a customer service consultant and I taught people how to transform customer service at the system level and at the level of one-to-one -one interactions. I loved this work. And before I ever made YouTube videos and before I even knew the word for CPTSD, I was teaching some of these same principles that I teach on this channel. I was intuitively noticing trauma in people and how it affected them. And I was teaching about staying focused on the positive outcome that you want in an interaction and about noticing and calming your triggers. And I'd get brought in to lead a half day workshop, usually with a clinic team or a phone support department. Usually it was a group of workers who had been getting a lot of complaints from customers. So talk about a tough crowd. I'd walk in and in almost every case, I'd face a group of people who, who were pissed off. They were feeling blamed, they were feeling tired, and they were just like daring me with their eyes to prove to them that I wasn't just one more useless trainer. And I'll tell you, I think a lot of my students back then were traumatized on the job from being immersed in bad interactions. They were often in systems that generated a lot of frustration and disappointment in customers. And the people working with those customers were bearing the brunt of that customer anger. They were getting blamed, but they didn't feel like they had the power to change anything. And for anyone who's ever had a job with conditions like that, you know it, it just sucks the life out of you. Your trauma goes up like a lot of the time. And when I'd start my workshop, I'd say most people felt like victims of their customers. And I could see how things got to that point. They weren't crazy, but they did have the power to make a lot of those interactions go differently, even so. And I knew I couldn't just start teaching it. it you know, I couldn't just begin and go to this room full of defensive, burned out people. They'd never listen to me. So I'd start by asking people if they'd had a bad customer service experience recently. <laughs> you know, basically everyone has. And I'd just invite anyone who wanted to, to tell us about it. And within 10 seconds, the first hand went up and then another hand and then another and another and another. Cause you know what? Everyone has been hurt as a customer before. And the stories came out and the emotions came out and people were laughing and then they were crying and they were talking about ways that bad customer service had hurt them and humiliated them and affected every part of their life, their health, their families, their kids, their, their self-confidence. And this was true not only when they were the customer in bad interactions, but when they were the worker who was maybe part of creating that bad interaction. It hurts both people, even when it's caused by just one of the people, the worker or the customer can cause it and both are affected. So then I'd ask them, have you had any good customer service experiences lately? And how did that affect you? And these amazing stories would come out of incredible kindness, generosity, lives being changed, one life actually being saved, you know, just like miracles. And then there'd be more laughter, more tears. And I'd ask them, when you're the person delivering customer service, if you could design all the days that you're going to be working in your life, would it be worth studying and practicing how you can deliver that good customer experience, not just for the customer, but for yourself? And everybody had this beautiful aha moment that customer service interactions are not this time like outside your life while you're just at work. This is a time it's, it's very much part of your life where you meet another human being and have the opportunity to help them feel seen and appreciated and cared for. And that is what everybody wants. And we give that to each other at the post office. We do it on the phone when we're, you know, trying to keep our bill from being shut off. We do it at the doctor's office. And yes, even with your mobile phone service provider, <laughs> even them. Now I'll be the first to acknowledge how hard it's been for me at times to stay regulated in customer service interactions. I have a history of trauma already. 
And that can make me feel really triggered when I get treated like I'm dumb and when I'm trying to get a problem solved and they're mamming me, you know, say, ma'am, you're going to have to really calm down. <laughs> well, then I, I really can't calm down. And by the way, if you think that you get dysregulated, you can take my dysregulation quiz. There is a link to it below in the description section. I have it under almost every video, but it's definitely under this one. Staying regulated is especially hard in customer service situations where things are going wrong, but you have no choice but to get through it because you need that product or service or solution and you just have to put up with any kind of bad treatment that they care to dish out. That is triggering. I'm talking about the person who puts you on hold for 45 minutes and then disconnects your call or the healthcare front desk worker who makes you say why you're visiting the doctor like right in front of 20 people in the waiting room or the government office that requires you to wait for four hours in a dirty room to even find out that you didn't bring the right paperwork and they're rude. The manager, right, who comes out and tells you again, ma'am, calm down, <laughs> you can tell. I really don't like that one. These experiences can feel demeaning, they're infuriating, they're unjust, and they can tap into deep parts of your old trauma, which is stuff you can't even connect to a specific experience necessarily in the past, but now in the moment, it's coming out like lava inside, like an emotional flashback. It's a feeling of overwhelm, a feeling like you need to get out of there, or you need to express that anger that's coming up inside you. And you see sometimes as it's coming out, you see in other people's faces how it's affecting them. I don't know about you, but that's like a feeling of shame where, you know, the feeling is really strong coming out. These are CPTSD reactions. And yes, they can be triggered by bad customer service. And I know a lot of you are nodding your heads right now thinking about some doozies of bad customer service you've had happen to you. And a lot of you are nodding too because you've been a service worker. Most of us have at one point or another, or you are right now and you're going through this right now because it works both ways, right? Part of what's happening in a bad customer service interaction is that the people working in these roles can feel just as threatened by the customer's power as the customer does by the worker's power. Now you may not feel like you have power as a customer, but the people who take jobs in customer service where because of factors they can't always control can also feel helpless in these situations. Well, in some organizations, these folks are encountering frustrated customers and getting yelled at all day. Have you ever had a job like that? And they also have a high probability of coming from a history of trauma. So to answer phones all day from angry customers, you'd almost have to have superpowers of dissociation that would allow you to just kind of like, you know, check out and tolerate that kind of interaction and getting hum hung up on, getting screamed at, or getting blamed or threatened that the customer is calling the manager and demanding that you be fired. <laughs> now, most customer service interactions are pretty good. Honestly, we can be grateful for that, but oh my gosh, when it's bad, it's so very bad. And if you have CPTSD, a bad interaction can trigger dysregulation in you that lasts, you know, for hours or days sometimes. Like a, a, a really bad interaction could cost me three days. I wouldn't be able to work very well or focus. You know, it'd be, it'd be almost like being sick. And, and that happening, if you, if you don't have any way to sort of change that or control it, it can hold you back. It can keep you down professionally and as a person. And I'm torn apart when I see that. So many people are carrying trauma. And when one person's trauma gets set off, it easily spreads to the other person and then another and another. And, you know, we're more connected than we realize sometimes, for better or for worse. Our nervous systems, our hearts, our emotions can be so tender. So we protect ourselves. We fight, we put up a wall. And that's why customer service interactions can be like this horrible mosh pit of aggression. But they can also provide opportunities for extraordinary human kindness and connection. It sometimes only takes one person, could be the worker, could be the customer, to turn it around. And it's worth being that person because why? Because even when you're on the phone with the gas company, even when you're at work at a job that's not so great, this is a day in your life. And no matter how trivial the task at hand is, 
there can be meaning in it because of the way that you're going to affect that other person who's there with you. Okay, so you ready for some tips? I'm gonna start with five tips for workers and then I'll give you five tips for customers. And it only takes one person, remember, sometimes to shift a negative interaction into a more positive interaction. So for workers, number one, make a welcoming statement. It's normally your role to acknowledge that a person has walked in the door or called you. So instead of saying, Dr. Smith's office, this is Wanda, what's your ID number? You can say, hello, thank you so much for holding. My name is Wanda and I'm the front desk coordinator here. May I ask your name? Ah, Joseph Jacobs. What is it I can help you with today? So yes, that took a few seconds longer than the perfunctory greeting that the first thing was, but it puts the whole interaction on a more personal footing. And when people recognize they're talking to a fellow human, someone who could be their sister or their son or their mother or their friend, they're more likely to feel safe and to feel a responsibility to treat you with respect and kindness. All right, the second tip, and this isn't rocket science, but it's a simple step that you always want to follow, and that's to use friendly words and tone of voice. So if you go, hi, how can I help you? It sounds different than, hi, how can I help you? If you use friendly words and tone of voice every time, the whole interaction can go in a completely different direction than it might have gone. And that's what you want. Good, friendly, connected interactions that make workdays feel like real experiences that are part of your real life. The third tip is to demonstrate empathy. So if a customer says, hi, I'm calling because I'm supposed to have a nine o'clock appointment there today, but my car won't start and now I'm running late, you could say, okay, what time will you be here? But that's glossing over what the person just told you. So you can improve the interaction by acknowledging the problems that are mentioned and problems are often why a customer service call or visit gets initiated, right? So when your customer says their car won't start and they'll be late for their appointment, you can first demonstrate empathy and say something like, oh no, that must be so stressful. Okay, let's figure out what we can do to make sure you still get seen today. Do you have a sense yet of how soon you can get here? And that sounds better, right? So the fourth tip for workers is to put things in the positive. So if that caller says, well, I'm, I'm waiting for roadside assistance and they said they'd be here at 9.15 or so. I think maybe I'll be able to get there at 10 or so. Then your first reaction might be to say, 10? No, we won't have any appointments then. We're completely full. But even if you don't have any appointments, you can put things in the positive and say, hmm, it might be hard to fit you in at 10, but I'll tell you what we can do. If it works for you, we can reschedule you the day after tomorrow. And then see how the answer was still no, but it was described in such a nice way, I'll tell you what we can do, right? So whereas a hard no can set off old feelings of people not caring or helping this person, putting things in the positive can help them feel like, ah, they have someone on their side, because they do. And finally, the fifth tip is to offer options. A big trigger for people with CPTSD is feeling trapped, needing something and counting on someone but not getting it and getting trapped without what they need. And these emotions and triggers aren't happening consciously. They're happening because of years and lifetimes of experience being powerless and trapped. So when your patient says, you know, uh, I can get there at 10, you can say, okay, we don't have any slots at 10, but we can reschedule you tomorrow. Or if you like, I can call you today if a slot opens up. It might not happen, but just in case it does, I can check and see if you'd be free to come in then. Now notice how the answer is still, you know, you'll have to reschedule. But now it's a choice how they'll do it. And that helps them know that they're respected, that they have a say in this, and that you care about them. Okay, now if you're a patient or customer in a customer service interaction, here are five tips that you can use to help make that interaction not just go positively, but turn out well so that you get what you need, your problem gets solved, and you get respected and cared for. All right, one, don't just begin with a question or complaint like, like, yes, I bought this flashlight here yesterday and it doesn't work. You can begin your interaction by making eye contact and smiling at the worker who's gonna be helping you and greet them. This is to help create a connection of two people that sort of sets the foundation for a better interaction. Then you can tell them why you're there. So number two is, just like I told the workers in their five tips, 
Your second tip is to use friendly words and friendly tone of voice. This is like the magic tonic for things that happen between people. Friendliness is something we all need, and it's more likely to elicit empathy and cooperation from the person who's working with you. Number three is explain the problem or complaint or need that you have as clearly as you can without long stories, without blame, even if the broken flashlight created a problem for you. You don't have to go into what the whole problem was. You can just tell them, ah, it doesn't work. All right, because then number four is if needed, to demonstrate empathy. When a customer has a complaint or when a store is really busy or when there have been problems, it can be really stressful for the worker too. So especially if the worker is accustomed to getting complaints from people who you know, give them a hard time, um, start raising their voice, you don't want them to go to that emotional place. You want them to know that you're on their side, that you're working together. Because if their defenses come up, there's a risk that they'll doubt you or say something snarky to you or act cold and stony faced. And that's, that could end up triggering you. Then the hard feelings come up, <laughs> then they start ping ponging and then you say something and they say something and the whole thing can get very tense. So the solution is just stay kind and calm about the situation. Give the worker and the store the benefit of the doubt that they're acting in good faith. Let them know the resolution that you'd like. So in this case, let's say you want a replacement flashlight. And then that brings us to the fifth tip, which you might need if say they tell you they can't give you what you want. Let's say they've run out of flashlights and it's tempting in those moments to let them know, I'm so irritated, you know, I bought this, I you know, was counting on this, it's gonna be a big hassle to go get another one. Yeah, you wanna tell them you're inconvenienced, but I'm just telling you, there's no point in bringing that in. They know that, they don't have another one. So just remember, these interactions are part of your life. You want your life to be good. So the best thing that can happen is to get your refund and go somewhere else. And then treating people right here in this interaction with patience and kindness and goodwill. That's what you're gonna feel good about later. It's good to have those strengths with you ready for anything. You've probably noticed that the customer service skills we're talking about are, are good for just about any situation in life. And it all has to do with noticing when you're dysregulated, getting regulated and staying regulated more of the time so that you can show that kindness and patience with people.